and to the point. It's our intention to make this program um, very precise indeed. Within the hour, we should be done. And so we'll, I'd like to move on now to present the NESG Macroeconomic Outlook for 2018, the head of research at the NESG, Dr. Shegun. Please, Omishaki. Please put your hands together again. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the board of directors, and the CEO. Uh, we've all known why we are here this morning. So all I need to do is to quickly go through this report. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we are going to have access to the report. So we can then look at the report in detail. Um, about three weeks ago, I was considering some uh, issues within me, and I eventually was looking at a very serious scenario. This time around is not hypothetical, it is real. And I was asking myself, this is Nigeria. In 1960, how did we look? What was, what was happening then? And I discovered that we were just about 45 million. And the GDP per capita growth was around 1.9. And the poverty headcount then was so high, 69. OK, now, this is 2017. We are now officially about 196 million. The GDP per capita growth is 1.5 on the average. So in the real sense of it, we are not growing per capita. And the poverty headcount has increased to 79. Now what happens in 2050? There are reports, statistics that have been released regarding the population growth dimension of Nigeria by that time. One of them, the um, United Nations uh, uh, projection says by 2015, Nigeria will be the third, you know, populous country in the world. Far, I mean, above the U.S. and other developed countries, only following China and India. That is a huge responsibility for us. It looks like a good news, but it could be a bad news. Now. If we continue with this dimension of neglect, especially with respect to social and economic inclusion, if we continue by focusing on a, a growth narrative on just mere growth, if we continue to neglect the situations of unemployment and the rest, what is going to happen, happen to us by this year? So it means we are preparing for a huge demographic problem. And so, that brings a very huge question to all of us. How prepared are we for these demographic emergencies? Are we going to continue in this terrain, celebrating oil-led growth, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 point this, 0 point that, while we have massive social issues? Are we going to see this as our foundation or bedrock for poor, uh, poor growth? What is going to happen to growth that is led by a wide majority of sectors? And so, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, I want to quickly speak on what we touched in this report. I will speak on the situation of Nigeria in 2017. I will also consider the key issue that we looked at in the report, which happens to be around inclusive growth. And I will also give us a projection for 2018. Okay, this is Nigeria from 2010. There are many things you will see here quickly. You have different sectoral contribution to output. You also have the total GDP growth over time from 2010 to 2017, third quarter. You will also see how oil development, oil sector development seems to be dictating the pattern of growth over time. You also see how so many sectors seem to be silent in terms of their contribution to GDP. And so we eventually came out of 
recession, and uh, we are still expecting to go beyond recession and then have a strong growth. But beyond this growth, what happens to these issues that is lead, they, are, they are looking at us in the face? What happens to the Human Development Index? What happens to corruption perception? What happens to mystery index? What happens to the poverty gap? What happens to the inclusive growth index? What happens to weak infrastructure and institutions? What happens to different social and economic issues that seems to be neglected in the discourse of growth in Nigeria? If we keep having these neglected, we are looking at a situation that the economy will be so big, the people will be so big, but the reward of the, of the growth or the benefit will be so small. This is what led us into considering the inclusive growth analysis in this report. And so in this report, you will get very soon, we look at the inclusive growth based on three main uh, pillars and driven by a major driver, which is governance and institution. We ask ourselves that beyond growth, we should start you know, looking at the pace of growth and the pattern of growth. The pace, yes, we have to grow. When you don't grow, you don't develop. But again, we look at the pattern. What happens to other sectors that seems not to be contributing to this growth? How do we open up to even those sectors? For instance, oil and gas industry. How do we move beyond just selling crude oil? How do we develop our petrochemical uh, subsectors? How do we open up our agriculture? How do we get value addition? How do we make sure that the mining sector and all other neglected sectors are contributing? How do we make sure that we have more improved, good job by opening up these sectors? And everything here is based on good governance and institutions. And so to us, we believe that 2018, yes, we will grow. But the question is, how are we growing? The question is, how do we manage the huge potential and the forecast and the projection that we have ahead of us? We have very brief projections for 2018, and that happens to be under different scenarios. We have the optimistic, the business as usual, and the pessimistic case. As you could see, if you look at this critically, you will see that every scenario is still being driven or guided by oil sector. So we have different assumptions for each of the scenario, and we have different outlook based on the mac uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, model that we used. And so we believe that if we vigorously, uh, after inclusive growth this, this year and years to come, especially this year, 2018, we, we likely have a situation where if the crude oil uh, uh, sector is still doing fine in terms of the international market, the price and the production domestic, uh, domestic production. And then we have the government that has the most, the, the strength, the will to you know, implement some of the inclusive growth uh, suggestions and, and, and uh, policies that we have highlighted in, in, in the book. We'll have a situation where our, our real GDP growth will be like 3.5% and that the inflation rate will be at 15%. Also, if you look at the uh, business as usual, which seems to be what will likely happen given this same terrain that we've been following through, we believe that let's assume that the oil price maintains 60% on the average during the year. Yes, you can have some uh, outliers, but on the average, and the government is still playing like, okay, we want to improve the ease of doing business, we want to do this, and they continue with the same basic institutional reforms, then this is the outlook. We are likely going to have 2.3% growth in GDP, and we are likely going to have unemployment rate increase. Unemployment and underemployment, anyway, increase to 35%. But if the situation got, gets worse, such that the government is preoccupied with the election, such that the government is preoccupied with politicking, then we are likely going to have a very bad scenario that the highly celebrated growth potentials that we've been recording might turn out to be something bad. In, in such a case, we assume that if the oil price, of course, which has been driven the growth 
dynamics in Nigeria. Falls back to 48 on the half bridge this year, we are likely going to have 1.5% growth. So all these projections are pointing to the fact that we should change our narrative of growth to mere lean, weak growth into a more inclusive growth this year and beyond. Thank you for listening to me. And we are with your questions and clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Omishaki. Um, a lot of food for thought. He obviously ran through it very quickly, but as we will unveil the report, you have an opportunity to, to drill down into the numbers and some of the policy suggestions. And we'll be hearing more about those policy suggestions and views on the outlook for the economy. Um, we have the pleasure of inviting to the microphone to share his thoughts as well. Some brief remarks on the outlook for the economy. A gentleman that needs very little introduction in Nigeria. Um, obviously, he has been a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, and we are delighted to have him as a board member of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. And indeed, the NESG Board Committee on Research, he heads that up, he's the chairman of that. Please make very welcome with a resounding applause, a Tottenham Hotspur fan. <laughs> <laughs> He's very proud of that. Please welcome Dr. Doin Salami. Um, if you don't mind, if you can step here, sir, for the view of those who are watching via live stream, if you don't mind. Please. Um, well, it would be bad manners to disturb the chairman to my left or the CEO to my right. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, at least, no matter how bad my own matter is, those who support the Arsenal can't be having a good time of it currently, so, and uh, if I, we are, oh, no, no, we do know a transition to the championship, but that's all right. Um, in a number of senses, I suppose I might be the one being held responsible for this outlook. After all, I lead the team that has produced it. A couple of things to say. The outlook has actually brightened very considerably for Nigeria. The challenge is not whether the outlook is bright. The challenge is whether Nigeria will take advantage of the improving environment in which she must, well, in which she now finds herself. If you look at oil prices, as of today, you're looking at oil prices just short of $70 a barrel. <coughs> at the end of 2015, oil prices were slightly less than $40 a barrel. And so, in a period slightly over a year, We've seen oil prices continue to appreciate. Now, there is a sense in which we think markets will correct themselves because we suspect that oil has been overbought at this point. But that's not the point. Dr. Mishaki has quite lucidly put some of the issues on the table. And my comments will try and divide this up into two parts. In the very short term, and when I say the very short term, I look at 2018, let's just say the period until the elections. And what is pretty clear is that the external environment looks good. But the key question is going to be, will the domestic policy environment in the run up to an election take some of the remaining hard decisions that really do need to be taken. I've made the point many a time about two key dimensions. The first is what's going to be the role of prices in resource allocation in Nigeria. We cannot be told that Nigeria continues to spend the better part of a billion naira every day in oil subsidy. 
what call it whatever name you want, augmentation, subsidy. I've had so many names, you know, had it called so many names. But the point remains that how do we solve that? Second, Nigeria has a multiplicity of rates for her currency. Again, we need to, we may say in the short term, these are, I don't want to say inevitable, but these are tolerable. But we have to have a way of transition from where we are to what we consider to be ideal. The fundamental challenge is, I'm not clear we have articulated that ideal so that everybody can see that as circumstances permit us, this is our preferred direction of movement. So that for me is the short-term challenge that we really are going to have to face. In the medium term, there are a number of things that are happening which I think are not just commendable, but we hope will come to fruition soon enough. I look at the NESG's work, especially with the National Assembly. NASBA, the National Assembly Business Environment Roundtable. And if you look at some of the legislation going through the National Assembly today, especially those pieces of legislation that deal with infrastructure, in my view, they are potentially huge game changers. Why? Because I won't say for the first time, but certainly what the National Assembly is aiming at is a scenario that encourages private capital into infrastructure provision. Whether we like it or not, Nigeria is relative to her requirements, capital deficient. The ERGP is clear, $3 trillion over three decades is what we need to spend. And so if you're going to spend $3 trillion at the rate of $100 billion a year, all the state's federal budgets do not amount to, amount in total to less than half of that. And so whether we like it or not, private capital has to come to the table. Now, the challenge is in the run up to an election, will all these bills come to fruition? Will they be passed and will they be assented to? For me, the omens look good in the sense that we have seen a concentration by the government on things that ease or promote the ease of doing business. That needs to continue. Nigeria, we've made 24 points gain, another 24 points in each of the next two to three years, fundamentally transforms the nature of this economy. Fundamentally too, if we decide on whether or not the price mechanism and the role for the price mechanism and private capital. And so, as we look, we are clear from the NESG that the outlook is bright. But we must not make the same mistake that we have done in the past, where growth has not been accompanied by development and less has it been inclusive. Which is why the theme or the special focus of this report is not just about saying we can grow, we need to grow, but focusing on the inclusiveness of that growth. You cannot have a population that is 79% below the poverty line. That's far too high. It's, you know, it's just too high. I was in a conversation yesterday where a friend reminded me that what we now term the Arab Spring started in the least expected areas. And so you can then imagine how our own at 79% poverty kind of looks like. And so what this report has sought to do is not just to highlight the growth opportunities, the, the brightening nature of the outlook, but also to draw the attention of public and private policy makers to the fundamental challenge of ensuring inclusion. 
that it is only by inclusion, by ensuring inclusive growth, that Nigeria's cohesiveness can be assured. It is only by ensuring cohesive growth that peace can come. It's only by ensuring cohesive growth. In fact, cohes uh, sorry, inclusive growth has a kind of a spiraling out effect, a positive reinforcing spiral. People included in growth have more money to spend, businesses have better opportunities. It's a virtuous cycle, if you like. And so for us at this point, we are clear two things. One, the outlook is brighter. Two, the imperative of inclusion has never been greater. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, on I must commend my colleagues on the NESG's uh, research team. They have been a delight to lead. On their behalf, in thanking them for the work, I also commend the report to you all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Dr. Salami. Always useful insights and food for thought. All right, so we've come to the point where we would be unveiling this report and um, doing the honor for us will be um, a delightful array of contributors, I like to call them, to the NESG. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Mr. D. Kramer, an NESG patron. Please can we put our hands together for him? I know so many of us here have made incredible contributions to the NSG over the years, but we really appreciate what you've done, sir. Thank you so much for coming today. Of course, our chairman, uh, Mr. Kiari Buka, Dr. Doin Salami, and our distinguished CEO. Okay, so we need to mix it up. Wonderful. Wonderful. I, 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 I agree. I'm on your side, sir. <laughs> Good. Good. Good morning, distinguished. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, was it was it about seventeen hours ago? where I sat across from Dick Kramer on the very table where the idea of NESG came up. So once again, uh, Mr. Kramer, thank you for being a part of the growth and development of Nigeria. Um, with this, I would like to go ahead and launch. So. <laughs> Please. All right, one, two, three. Thank you very much. The, the reports need to get off the table. Please, if you don't mind, can you all hold a copy of the report? And um, let me just bring one for each person. Okay, you go. Oh, I'm going to get you one. Yeah, I think that one's going to fall again. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, we just, just for the photo opts. If you don't mind, just all standing in a straight line, please. There, there is, there is there's room here, yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, so we'll be passing it uh, um, around the room. And of course, it is available on the NESG website as well. And we now would like to give everyone an opportunity to interrogate the reports, interrogate some of the um, research resources we have at the NESG on their thoughts on the economy. So we'll be passing the microphone as you get the opportunity to take a look at the report, we'll pass the microphone across the room. And if you do have any comments or... Okay. If
If you do have any comments or questions, you can please signify by raising up your hands, introduce yourself, and please direct your comments or questions. Christian, let me give you start. I wanted to get Doyen's views on something that troubles me even more than some of the things that have been brought up so far. And of course, I haven't read the report. I've been remiss in not being at the summit for several years. So maybe, maybe I'm out of touch with reality a little bit. But being an American, I am very concerned about the ability to create the skills and the, and the jobs and you have to only look at the election that we had in the United States last year to realize that people that are partly left out maybe uh, vote for the wrong person. Now, if you got any Trump supporters in the room, they can see me, <laughs> see, see me later. But the U.S. has a very low population growth compared to Nigeria. And a much stronger education system, although it needs upgrade. And yet we've got a, a big problem in the United States of having growth that goes to the top 50% of the economy or some percentage like that and does not trickle down to the rank and file of people, many of whom their jobs are being eliminated or at least get scaled down. Some of it going overseas, which may be solved a little bit by the changes in tax systems and others that are happening right now. But in general, it's probably inevitable that the US will be exporting jobs uh, o over time. Now let's contrast that with Nigeria. I didn't hear much, Doyen, in the discussion about education, things that will create the, the climate for employment, things that will actually improve the investment climate in a way in which you'll attract the right kind of businesses, et cetera. And if you're really looking at a population where you're third in the world in population, <laughs> I guess I'm glad I'm this age and, and leaving <laughs> because I, I think you're gonna have a, almost a chaos on your hands. Now, I can tell you every time I get on a plane to go to the United States and back, Nothing wrong with Nigerians. When they go to the United States, they thrive. The problem is that I'd like to see us really working on and the summit leading it is how do we create the conditions for the Nigerian population to thrive and perhaps to be even more uh, prudent in, in birth control and things of this nature so that the, the, the whole uh, growth of the economy benefits people uh, in, in a balanced way. And I guess I came today partly because I was concerned that are we really looking at this in the, in the summit? And of course, I haven't read the book or the report, but that, that's what my concern is. Sorry if that was a long-winded question. Um, well, I suppose I have been encouraged that um, they should hand the mic to Dick. <laughs> I should now be ready <laughs> to pay for that. 
Um, but I, I, I think Dick raises arguably the most fundamental challenge that, in my view, Nigeria faces. From the NESG's perspective and from the work that the research team does, we've been clear for a while, a very, you know, at least for a decade, that the issues around employability are major issues to be dealt with. Let me make the point. First of all, unemployment is about 18%. But underemployment is even worse. There are some demographies, in other words, age groups, where it's more than 45%. And that, as Dick rightly says, poses a challenge for Nigeria's security and societal cohesion. You cannot have a group of forgive my language, not haves. If 79% of the population is officially recorded as being below the poverty line, then really we've got it. When you look at the spending numbers, the last set of numbers we were, that were complete and we were able to play around with tend to show that the bottom 20% are responsible for probably about 3% of total spend. And so, when you begin to look at that, then you can begin to understand the magnitude of the problem. I cannot speak for the government, but as I am sure some of you in this room are aware, the NSG actually did have, I think about two summits ago, a focus on education. A focus on education. And we continued at the last summit to try and follow up on some of that um, conversation. So the NESG is fully mindful of the issues around, uh, not, not even from a political dimension, just from the dimension of having a labor force that is fit for purpose. Because that is fundamental. If Nigeria is going to be competitive, her labor force must be competitive, must be fit for purpose. Let me make the point without any you know, um, equivocation. Some of the Asian countries, over time, will begin to lose competitiveness. It's just part of economic evolution. There is nothing new or strange about it. The question will be, and is already, will Nigeria be in a position to take advantage of that loss of competitiveness? We certainly have the population but whether we have the labor force, that's a very different matter entirely. And I argue that arguably the biggest single opportunity that exists in Nigeria today is actually not infrastructure. It actually is human capital. In my village, and I keep reminding everybody that I'm an Ijebu boy, that they tell me, I'm trying loosely to um, translate something, which speaks to the biggest irony for a town of hungry people is for an elephant to drop dead at their entrance, at their entrance gate, and they have no knives. So they are hungry. They would like food. An elephant is probably the biggest mass of meat that you are going to get. An elephant cheerfully arrives and cheerfully falls dead, but they have no knives. How do you want to share it? So in other words, as opportunities emerge, will Nigeria have the labor force able to take advantage of those opportunities? It would be unfair to the government if one, at least at the federal level, if one does not recognize, I think it was towards the end of last year, there was an, a federal executive council um, retreat on education. And the education minister did point out that Nigeria needed to devote substantially more resources in order to increase the usefulness of her education sector to her economic ambitions. So I think, Dick, you make a very valid point, and my sense is we are mindful of it at the summit. We are continuing to work with policymakers to see what we can get done. But there is a point that Dick also makes, which I think is a much more sensitive point, which is the point about population. Now, to deal with population is almost to invite a 
a unification of all the opposition. Because no matter how you look at it, we are not even sure how many we are. As a friend reminded me, and I hope this is correct, that even Lagos State in 2006, when the last sessions were held, was given a, was, you were told the population number is 9 million. But that subsequent to that, the government of Lagos went to the population tribunal and apparently 14, the results in 14 of the 20 local governments in Lagos have been nullified. Now, if that is correct, then it officially means even Lagos has no official population. So, but the point about population policy is that I don't see, we're, we're going to have to work very hard to get to that. Financial resources at the federal level are shared on the basis of population. So everybody has a reason to have a big population. You would have to take on the political establishment. You would have to take on the religious establishment where we are told that go ye forth and do various wonderful things, almost without you know, any restriction. Indeed, the traditionalists also <laughs> tell you we do not count the number of <laughs> children. And yet, as a country, it is very clear that we need to manage our population for it to be a source of dividend as opposed to be a source of difficulty. That, for me, is not an issue pre-election. Perhaps post-election, we might begin to think about that. But I think the first point is to try and get the education framework and the education infrastructure to a level where it produces a labor force that is fit for purpose, because that will then be the basis of inclusiveness. It is on the basis of inclusiveness that you can get growth of the kind of sustained and sustainable dimensions that we are all looking for. I hope that answer at least goes to some of the points you've raised. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Salami. We have a question from someone else here. Please introduce yourself and go straight to it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Vahela Kwaga from the Center for, Center for Public Policy Alternatives, Lagos. I'm here with my colleague, Apollo Wainebi. Uh, brilliant report, uh, well written. It's um, more or less like reading a Nigerian version of The Economist. I would like to know what the NESG is doing about research on institutions. Now, not organizations, not buildings, but norms, customs, values. Those are the things that determine whether or not your very sexy policy recommendations would work. You can realize lists of policy prescriptions like the World Bank guys did, you know, the Washington consensus and, oh, do this, oh, it's tax revenue, you're sure to develop. None of that stuff actually works if you don't have the institutions, the, um, the rules that govern relationships, the cognitive and mental framings that Nigerians have, and their outlook to what development should look like. I'd like to know what the NESG is doing in that regard, because I think that is pretty important. Thank you. All right, can we take the last, because if you're taking three comments, let's take all of them so that everybody can be. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Otto Abaseko from ProShare. Um, nice remarks on the report from NESG. Commendable what uh, NESG is doing. And uh, nice to meet Dr. Dwayne Salami again. My question goes concerning policy. And um, like Dr. Salami said, the external environment looks good, but domestically, we need to have a, a right balance in policy. At the moment, the monetary policy um, board, per se, has not been constituted because of uh, some issues between executive and the uh, legislature. And next week is supposed to be by, by design, the first MPC meeting. And that may not hold because of the situation of not having this board. I would like to hear from Dr. Salami, who was a former MPC member. What are the implications of that? And um, also, what the NESG can do through NASBA, because it's a very critical issue. I mean, monetary policy, if we if we want to move forward, we need to have an alignment between fiscal and monetary policy. Thank you. Do we have any more contributions? Okay. If you don't mind, let's take them. 
Yeah, my name is Kulele Boje. Um, I haven't read the report in detail, but I, I can see that one of the pages that, that, sort, of, that sort of attracted me was the pages around um, the four pillars of social inclusion, which is on page 22. Uh, very important points, but you know, these are inputs. What, what are, what's the output? Um, and my own is that the output has to be linked to, there needs to be industries or sectors that are ready to you know, absorb these new skills or enhanced skills, many of which would be vocational skills, you can call it, whether it's in the construction industry and, and in low, man, low, low tech manufacturing industries that absorb lots of skills, like in textiles and garments. Now, the reason I say so is that if you watch the, the impact on the, of the exchange rate on the economy in the last 18 months, we've been seeing a lot more informal exports than we've had ever for a long time. In the agricultural sector, in the consumer product sector, we're seeing clients of ours who are taking advantage of the, those parities in the exchange rate yeah. without any you know, formal export-led strategy policy or growth for this economy. And you know, export is in the mindset. It's a very different way to run an economy. Mm. And I'll give you one simple example. In Cote d'Ivoire, if a truck of cocoa is going from the north to the south to get to the port, and the driver is pulled aside for a traffic offense, the law in Cote d'Ivoire is that the, the police official must go with the truck to the port. After he's discharged the cocoa, then he then you know, takes him to him. But if he arrests the truck, the driver, and delays the truck, then the police officer is one who's at, who's at risk. Yeah. Absolutely. So that whole essence of how we take advantage of the exchange rate with, with, the, with the skills, economies of skill, and the fact that Asian countries are going to be much higher cost of production coming down to eventually hopefully to Western Africa. It's a long-term game, yes. but you must start somewhere. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm sure the um, CEO of NSG has been hoping to say something, so he has agreed to speak on the MPC and the implications thereof. <laughs> As I'm no longer a member of the MPC, it makes no sense for me to share any thoughts. And I have no thoughts, but the CEO, on behalf of NSG, does have some thoughts which he would like to share. So we'll come to you in a minute. As far as the, as far as the, as far as the question on institutions is concerned, I think we are all very clear about the role of institutions. If we weren't, we wouldn't, as, and as the NESG has done, continue to track the Global Competitiveness uh, Index of the World Economic Forum. And we don't just track it you know, on a very general basis. We track it at a very granular level, where we are looking for where those advocacy positions by the NESG can lead to improvements. Now, when you say institutions, don't forget, this is a democracy. It's got three arms of government. It's got that at the national level, subnational, the same thing. And so, for us, our engagement with the federal government, which I suppose you're, everybody here is aware, the flagship usually being in October at the summit. But people think that's the only time that we engage with the government. But that actually is not the case. Indeed, there is a huge and I re-emphasize a huge amount of work that goes on in this building and you know, in Abuja and elsewhere, where we are trying to engage not just with the federal government, but with state governments. Indeed, I was in this building yesterday, and the discussion was subnational governments, how do we engage with them in order to improve their economies and the institutional frameworks that help guide those economies. So for us, we are absolutely clear about that. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier in my comments, we engage with the National Assembly. NASBA is one of the initiatives. Um, and so uh, across the Nigerian policy making spectrum, the NESG is very clear about the need for institutional frameworks that encourage greater levels of certainty 
And which is why the question that I was raising earlier is Nigeria in some di dimensions needs to frame principles which speaks to this is how we will react if certain things happen. That way everybody can move along and pursue their own uh, interests. We take um, the comments by Mr. Elebute, you know, I, I, I think it's really, he has gone for my money to the heart of our report. Because we are very clear that yes, the environment is, the outlook's looking brighter, it's looking much better, but if social inclusion, and which is where again, the question raised earlier about education. Because if we are going to get people who have the skills, then the education system, whether it is vocation or other dimensions, we cannot continue what we have done for too long. In most other countries, the education spend is a pyramid where the largest spend is at the base and the smallest spend is at the top. Nigeria's pyramid is inverted. The largest spend is at the top. <laughs> the smallest spend is at the base. And therefore, in that inversion, you can imagine a lot of misplacement of things haven't gone the way they should have gone. And so to that extent, therefore, for us, we are very clear. If social inclusion is going to work, education is not just about classroom uh, education. It's actually about skill sets. What skill sets do we give our people that are relevant today and in the future? There was a point which was made earlier, and, and I think it goes back to Dick's question, but it also ties into um, Kunle's comments. Bear in mind, the way technology is going, especially with the issues around artificial intelligence and what robotics and robotic technology will achieve. There are even more fundamental societal structuring issues. How will the benefits of a new world of work begin to be appropriated and distributed? In countries where social security systems already exist, they at least already have channels that they can begin to look at. We don't have. Our social security is essentially informal. Yes, I'm not unmindful or unaware that the government has a program of school feeding, or sorry, sc providing school meals, nor am I unaware that the um, payments, the unconditional cash transfers are also already ongoing. But imagine, you're talking of a population projected at 400 million plus in 2050. Now, artificial intelligence in 2050, if what we are seeing today I was thinking to myself a few days ago, Elon Musk says, why must it take more than 20 minutes to travel from New York to London? And I thought to myself, oh boy. <laughs> exactly, that the speed at which the world economy will be moving will be something else. And it has huge implications. Today we speak about um, um, Industries that are labor intensive. <laughs> Sorry, down the line, what we call labor intensity will no longer apply. And to that extent, we need to begin now to reflect on how that will affect the economy and what we are going to do about it. It cannot just come upon us and we say it came upon us like a thief in the night. Sorry, we are seeing technology moving and we need to begin to reflect on how what implications that will have for us as a country, and what are we going to do about it? As of now, our conversations are rather mundane, given the nature of the fundamental challenges that we really are going to have to live up to. Ladies and gentlemen, let me um, again thank uh, Shegun Omishakin and his team. Um, in a sense, I really must, must thank them for because I have made their lives <laughs> <laughs> rather difficult, but truly, uh, Shegun, and to you and your team, a really big thank you for this report. Thank you. Well, I, I, I will answer the question on MPC, and, and, and that's because, again, part of our engagement with government is to let government realize that there are certain issues that you don't play politics with because of the implication for the economy. And so 
we, we engage with the National Assembly, and about a couple of days ago, they said, okay, we're going to resolve some of those things. So I don't know how quickly that will meet next week, but it's a point that we tell government that, look, let's know where politics stop, and let's know issues that must be business. And talking around skills, let me just add that with the NESG, one of the challenges we had was, again, with education, they didn't pick it, but we're working with the Ministry of Trade, Industry, uh, and uh, tr industry uh, and investment to see how can we link industry to the key skills that you need to do. So I know skill councils, discussions are on, and we've been pushing this in the last three years, and we'll continue at it. It is slow. But what I tell people is that they shouldn't forget that we are not government. <laughs> ours is advocacy, ours is pushing it. And in the last three years, we're focusing all the various uh, spheres of what a think tank should be doing. Beyond dialogue, we're doing watchdog work, and that's why we're emphasizing a lot more about evidence, about research that must drive all of this, along all our thematic groups that runs. We're doing intervention. As a matter of fact, we get, uh, and through your support, to, through the NESG fellowship, we then get people seconded to government to make sure that critical areas of government's issues that need to be addressed, we're pushing. But of course, these are dependent on the amount of fund, amount of fund available to us, and we are then linking people up. So it's 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 a for us it's something we do on a daily basis. It's a regular currency. We will do that. And like like Doyin said, the people live in the states. Resources are in the states, and no matter what is run at the federal level, unless we get the states to begin to work, we won't we won't get much. And that's why we're collaborating with people and partners to ensure. We drill this thing down to the state, uh, state level. At the NESG, we have a model, and then uh, it's a Mac, Mac model, and we try to use it to do some predictive work. We tried it first at Summit uh, 22, and it was just on the spot. I mean, I think it was Kunle that made that presentation that it was on the spot, and we've been trying it. We're tracking the, uh, the way I forecast it relative to what government and to, I mean, general outcome is. We're waiting for the December figure. But from what we're seeing with our prediction, we're probably going to be on spot on it again. And so, so for us, we want evidence to drive it. And some of our discussions does not end here. We will face the presidency at the president, VP level, directors are all involved, and people are all involved, making sure that we push the, 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 the boundaries. Uh, but we appreciate your continuous support for NESG. We will continue to ask you to support but you know what? If you keep quiet and don't engage, you give them the room to just do whatever it is they want to do. So it is something we do on a continuous basis. I want to urge that we don't get tired. Um, we take the successes as they come, and we keep going until we get to what, where exactly we want to go. So on behalf of my, my chairman, my directors, and let me recognize my directors that are here. Uh, I have uh, Tony Atta is in person from N N N NLNG. Uh, Kule Elebute KPMG is here. Um, and Tifasi, um, Tif, uh, Onyechi Tifasi of Siemens, and um, Udeme Ufot. These are my directors. No, we have that, more here. that is we Chris. Have more here. Chris, Chris, I'm seeing you, they're blocking you. Chris Gerabolis of PZ are here, and doing salami. Cereal. My directors are here. Those are my directors. Serial works at the Energy Policy Commission, so we recognize you. And so, I want to thank all of you for coming, and we look forward to your, you know, responding to us when we go again. We always will come to you. I mean, that's for sure. I'm never tired of coming to you, but thank you for responding. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, CEO. And once again, I want to say thank you for everyone for coming. Um, just a quick note, um, as the CEO has mentioned um, research is, the, is at the core of what drives our advocacy. And the report that we're sharing today is just one of several um, documents that we have been putting out at the NESG. And um, there is an opportunity for you to support that effort. Um, a long list. Unfortunately, the projector has just gone off at the wrong time. But there's an opportunity for you to collaborate with us in publishing quite a few of those um, reports. There's a business confidence monitor report, macroeconomic outlook, which we just shared, state of the economy, and several other um, documents that you can support us in presenting. 
So once again, thank you very much. Um, we encourage the press people to should please see me. We'll be sharing some documents um, relating to this presentation. Thank you very much and have a good morning.